Hey everybody, welcome to the Game Junkie Show, episode three. I am here with my friend Tristan. Hi Tristan. Hey. And I have asked Tristan to come on today. Um, he is uh, kind of a guru into accessibility. And we wanted to spend some time and talk about accessibility in gaming and really what that means and why it's important and um, talk about what kind of companies are are kind of making headway in different places. So thanks for coming on the show, Tristan. Yeah, thank you for letting me be here. Oh, absolutely. So I just want to quickly point out when I hear people talk about accessibility in gaming, generally the place that my head goes is I think of I think of access, right? Like how how easy or hard is it for people to access playing games? I think of affordability. Is is gaming uh, accessible or non accessible in certain places uh, because of the cost options? But I think until recently, I don't think that many people really think of accessibility uh, in terms of how do people. Uh, with various disabilities or impairments, play these games and access the content within these games. And I know that that's a big passion point that you have. So just kind of start us off and, um, you know, tell us tell us a little bit about what you know. Well, honestly, I, I, I hate to use the term guru just because I feel <laughs> like I'm totally uneducated compared to some other people. I think I've done enough research to, like, know what I'm talking about today, but Trying to, I'm trying to be humble here. I don't want to say, like, I know everything, but but I will say I've looked into it enough to know what I'm talking about today. Um, I think, for me, I mean, I just, there was, uh, I was in community college, and I had, like, a public speaking course. We could choose any topic, and I was very curious about accessibility in games. So I started doing research, um, and then I started noticing things as I was playing games that kind of made me just... Uh, take a step back and realize this would be really difficult for someone who, I don't know, let's say didn't have 10 fingers or um, who couldn't hear as well. And so I started noticing these things and I was like, there could be very easy changes that could make this easier for someone else to get the same experience I did. Um, just to take an example, recently I was playing um, Halo, the Master Chief Collection, and uh, and I noticed that, like, when I was playing Halo Reach, there's, um, that game all ha has all these, like, teammates, like, computer characters that talk to you, and, um, they talk in-game. Now, in the cutscenes, there's subtitles. In the game itself, there's not. And so you're missing, like, half the dialogue. And, like, just one of those things where if you can't hear it well, then you're kind of out of luck, because there's no option to put them on. And so there's not really a standard for these sort of things. Wow. And that's, see, that's, I, I think it's something that for a lot of us, we don't think about it because we have been blessed enough that we don't have the impairment. So something as simple as a subtitle, we don't think about how uh, it affects us or other players. Um, so outside of subtitles, I know there are different, and I know very little about this, I, I've seen options of things for color blindness or people that see in right. Um, I can give you a good example of of something. Do, so a company doing it right. Um, what is the company that makes? Um, my mind's blanking on their name. That makes Rocket League. Um, I know Epic Games oh. publishes it now, but I think it's Psychonics that makes Rocket League. If I remember correctly, uh, that sounds about right. But well, anyways, point being that. The way Rocket League is, is uh, done is like there's a blue and an orange team. And if you actually look at the color spectrum, no matter what color blindness you have, you can distinguish between blue and orange. That's why they made it like that. And so uh -huh. it's something you don't even think about. You're just like, oh, those are cool colors. But there's a reason they chose those colors. And so if you if they had any other color combination, it could have been difficult for some people on different color blindness spectrums. That's interesting. So... Color blindness isn't, it's, it's not just a standard um, kind of cut and paste thing. You may have different spectrums of yeah, colors. There's different, that, yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. There's different degrees of it. Yeah, so some someone may not have, if I remember correctly, someone may not be able to say pink, see pink right or see greens. Um, there's like 
I think three or four different kinds of colorblindness that all have different scales of like what turns into like what they can't see, like what turns out to look like another color or just like gray or whatever. Okay. And I think, you know, really thinking about that, I say to myself, oh, I was aware of that, but it never translated in my brain how, how that would affect the settings or the modifications within a game. Um, right. I, I know that I've also seen, and, and where I got most of this from, by the way, is The Last of Us 2. I had heard people say that Naughty Dog had just done a breakthrough job um, with accessibility options. And I was very curious because I knew so little about it. And I, I did notice that they had uh, something that made like, like ping sounds or it helped. Is, is that for mm -hmm. a certain type of hearing in, impairment or, or. Mm -hmm. a Yeah. Sorry. Hold on. I have a cough. So yeah, basically, um, the last of us part two, it, uh, they did really well on accessibility. And for that specifically, it's, yeah, if it's for hear hearing, it's for, actually, since it's basically a sound, it's actually for people with blind impairments. So that way you can know what's going on around you. And so uh, those little, like, pings help people who can't see as well navigate through the game. There's also a thing in The Last of Us Part Two that makes um everything but the characters all, like, dark and black. Like, there's no, no more textures on them. Um, besides like outlines, like little white outlines or whatever. And then, but then the characters are blue and red. So the good guys are blue and then the, the bad guys are red. And then that just makes it super easy for someone who can't, uh, really see that well just to be able to see like, oh, hey, there's the bad guy. There's the, there's the good guy. And you can, you can have these in combination with the other thing you just mentioned. So it's not okay. one or the other. You can turn as many settings on as you want. Which I guess that makes sense now that I think about it, that ping almost might be similar to like an echo location where if I can't visually see it, I can right. tell the distance away from me based on the, is that the, the yeah, theory there? Yeah, I believe that's what it is. Yeah. Um, trying to think of something. This, this reminded me of something similar, um, but it, it actually helps deaf people. So if you play Minecraft, Minecraft, there's an option in it where it'll let you know on screen like, how far things are from you and what direction they're coming from you. Like, if a chicken makes a noise, it'll let you know it's coming from the right. And then um, and it'll let you know on screen with dialogue on the screen. Uh, that's for people who are deaf and can't tell that there's a chicken next to them. Or maybe there's, like, a skeleton or whatever. So does it pop up on the screen? So it's like Yeah, it pops text? up on the screen as, like, text, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So are there other... Are there other games outside of The Last of Us 2 or other developers outside of Naughty Dog that you think has done a really stellar job of incorporating accessibility options? Um, I mean, like, sorry, let me think at the top of my head. Actually, I mean, in terms of stellar jobs, I think, I think most developers have a good way to improve. I can think of specific examples at the top of my head. Um, Among Us actually had a very good update for colorblind people um if you i don't know if you played that but there's like a there's like a little task in it where you move these wires around and you connect connect them to the same color if you're colorblind that's really difficult so what they did was made a free update that put um that put shapes on it and each shape matched to a color and then now now colorblind people can can play it just something as simple as that and so i think what that shows to me though is like if a company can take feedback and then use it. That mean that makes them a better company to me. It, it doesn't. You don't have to do. Um, you don't necessarily need to go as far as Naughty Dog did. I hope you do, but if you can just take the feedback, you're already in a step in the right direction towards that goal. That's pretty cool. Now I've seen a, a device. Uh, I don't know exactly where I saw it. I want to say this might be a device that either is used with Xbox or will be. It it looked almost like a like a rectangle. Oh, I know what you're had, talking about. I was yeah. I was wanting to bring that up actually. Yes, please explain to to what is that and, and how is that used. So so before you were asking more about game game development, so I was thinking software, but I can tell you on a hardware front front, Microsoft has the best accessibility out there out of the big three 
out of any hardware manufacturer I've seen. And the reason for that is what you just brought up, which is called the Xbox Accessibility Controller. It already came out. Um, they, they're they not producing any of them right now because they're wanting to change it and update it and make it better. But basically, what it is is um, it functions as an Xbox controller. So so anywhere you would use an Xbox One controller, so either whether it's on Xbox One, Xbox Series S or X, or Windows 10, it functions just like one. On the software side, the the computer or the Xbox sees it the same. Uh, but what it is is essentially um, like I mean, how do I put this? So people who have disabilities and different things, like especially motor disabilities, they usually use specialized devices made by companies. Um, I can't think of the particular name of them, but they're made by special companies that do these things, and uh, they use headphone jacks. And so, like, they'll put in um, a one-handed controller into a headphone jack, and or so, like maybe it'll be assigned to a button or different things like that. And so. What Microsoft did was just made uh, made something that would be universal for those things. So on the side, the Xbox accessibility controller, like the side facing the console when you're using it, there is like 18 headphone jacks. There's one for each button, basically. And so you can map a button to any device you want as long as and you already have it if you're disabled you already have the device for the right trigger or for the left stick or whatever and so functionally it does all those things and then on the top of it you have a giant um a and b button i believe it is just to make it really easy for you to press it and then a d-pad and a few other things um i think that works really well and then the other reason i think microsoft is a is a big uh is like the best one best company hardware wise is they have options on the xbox that i just don't see on the other consoles and so like um there's an option called co-pilot mode so you can use two xbox controllers as one uh like one person on the system so as one user and so uh if someone if someone wanted to play let's say dark souls right and they needed help with it and they couldn't react as quickly but they wanted to do like healing what well, what could happen is i could have let's say like my brother, for example, he could be doing the fighting that I could be doing the healing. Just something super simple like that. Wow, that's really cool. I had no idea. And it, uh, I mean, you're saying things and making me think of, I'm, I don't even think about these things. I mean, if you have maybe only one arm, only one hand, right? This gives you yeah. an ability to game. Or uh, if if you just need that little bit of assistance, um, you saying the word assistance did bring something up to me. I thought that I had seen somewhere where some uh, some games or some developer out there had some type of function. It I may struggle to articulate this, but some games don't have a difficulty setting, or some games are challenging. Maybe, maybe even regardless of their difficulty setting for specific players. Is there some kind of software or some kind of tool out there that helps somebody scale with that or that? As far as I know, there isn't. And I think, to me, I know this opinion is controversial, but I think developers should just put more difficulty options in their games. I don't... To me, if you want to play on hard mode, go right ahead. It doesn't stop me from playing on easy, and it doesn't take away from your victory. So I don't understand controversy around that you can still keep a game can still be known for being difficult while also having easier options for players that need them or want them so, so i think it should be on the developer side just to make easier options so the argument that you and normally i would very much be on the side of uh, if the developer makes it hard it's hard if, if they choose not to add the settings they don't add the settings but you're making a very great point tristan Adding those settings might be a key difference for somebody that may have some impairments on the motor function side who may not be able to react as quickly or may not be able to react with the same precision in the mechanics, essentially. Right, exactly. And I think generally, too, I think um, I'm just kind of a tangent, but I think having more difficulty settings isn't really a bad thing. For people who aren't ex like who aren't needing this ex these accessibility options, I don't see it as a as a lose because I don't I don't think it like it, 
I, I don't want to tell a developer what to do. Let me make it clear, okay? If you want to make your game super hard, I'm not going to stop you, but I am going to urge you to put an easier option because it doesn't cost that. I'm no game developer, but I can't assume it doesn't cost that much to tone down like how smart your AI is or whatever. You're not making it more challenging as a developer. You're not like putting more on yourself. You're putting less on yourself to do that, I feel like. So I don't know. It's not, it can't be that hard to do. And it doesn't take away that much from the experience for those who want it that way. Well, I think that we should definitely look at doing a future episode and getting some game developers Sorry. on here <laughs> and talking game about, game. no, that's good. I, I think that's a great idea. And we should talk about stuff like that. I believe um, th Tristan never apologize. Your opinion is always welcome here, my friend. This is good stuff because you have me thinking. And I hope that people who are watching and listening are thinking too. Um, and for people who like me were on the camp of make it hard may see the the options of incorporating a difficulty or incorporating some kind of will we see one day will we see some kind of, of piece of software that provides assistance or something so those are all certainly things to think about and you bring up cost which is a really good thing to talk about there's adding accessibility certainly i have to assume that that's a, a lot of additional development and work I think, depending on what you do, yes. I, I can't imagine, for example, I brought up Among Us earlier, I can't imagine adding circles and squares and triangles to one task. The eight, eight of them, mind you, eight shapes was costly, right? Depends on what you do. Some things can be really cheap and make the world to someone. So it's a case-by-case -case basis. But something like making a hold-on controller for your system, that was really expensive, and I'm surprised Microsoft even did that for honestly a very small community of people so that that was i was really proud of that because that showed that they cared more about their users than about what money they were making from that i can't imagine they got any um i can't imagine they sold that in um for a profit yeah it's i mean i i worked in software for for a bit but not not in the in the gaming industry in the in the bespoke database industry so if we look at if if we just look at Naughty Dog and what they did with The Last of Us 2, if we look at that being a potential new bar moving forward, yeah. that's pretty significant work, which yeah. then kind of brings up the discussion. You know, people, a, a hot topic right now is, you know, some games are $10 more. Is it, to me, it's sounding like it's worth it if it costs gamers a little bit more money to buy these games that they have more lines of resolution they have more features with the dual sense um but what if they also have more features for a very large community that can't access the vanilla game the way it is i mean do you think that those are valid kind of things for us to think about as consumers? honestly if, sorry, if honestly if they brought in more accessibility features i would gladly pay that ten dollars more because I'm honestly on the other end of the fence. Like, do we really need it to be ten dollars more? But that would be a key jump for me. I would definitely love that. Because I know that it does cost a lot, and it's, and I can't imagine for the Last of Us Part Two with how much stuff they put in that like uh, that costs a lot of money. Yeah. So that's another thing yeah. to think about there. I know that I was recently playing a, a game, Odd World Soulstorm, which was freaking hard. <laughs> Freaking hard. That's a hard game, y'all. That is an old school, like, it's very old school, like Ninja Gaiden, kind of, it's more cartoony, like Battletoads, but it's freaking hard. And I, I, it was, it was tough. It was tough to beat that game. I was, I was getting pissed for a little bit. I mean, I was dying and dying and dying. And I was talking to this guy on YouTube and this kid who is maybe 19 years old, um, is legally blind and he beat the game based on sounds and that game doesn't have a lot of accessibility options and he beat it completely based on sound so what some of these people have to do to overcome these in impairments it's such it, is it i mean is it really that simple to kind of demand a little more accessibility in gaming and kind of how how do we voice that as consumers, if if we want to say like, hey, we we want to see more accessibility in gaming, we would like more people to be able to enjoy this medium. Where where do we go? How do we support that? How do how do we kind of ask for that? 
Well, I think a lot of people just need to be asking for it for the to begin with. I don't think we have enough voices in the community asking for it. That's that's my that's my concern right now is like no one like if it wasn't brought up on Twitter, I don't think people would have really noticed um Last of Us Part 2's accessibility. Like how many people actually went into that into that options menu just to look at that stuff? Not many, I assume, right? And so for me it's like not even not that many people even know about accessibility needs, right? Not a lot of people even care about it because it's just not part of their life. I don't blame them for not caring. My issue, though, becomes how do we get them to care, right? And then if so, if you have enough people saying something, usually it'll change. Um, I don't know of a particular, like, um, website or forum that we could go to to voice our concerns aside from just telling people on Twitter seems to work sometimes um uh but i think i think we need to educate people more on accessibility to begin with and so that they can get asking for it and honestly a lot of people use some accessibility options that um that aren't even uh who i wouldn't say need them like ubisoft said 73 percent of their users had subtitles on I I actually use subtitles. It does not matter how loud I turn the game. I I don't actually know. I like I like reading it. I I don't now that I think about it. I I like having the words. And, and if sometimes I know certain accents, like somebody who's really really British, like sometimes I'll say words and I'm like, what 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 they say? What is so I prefer but i didn't expect 73 percent that seems that seems pretty high and yeah it is it is really high and that's what i like about it though it shows that these things matter to people some of these things at least at least subtitles do and i think that's that's a good thing and i think uh th i think that'll make a lot of companies more um willing to put subtitles in their games because if you look at, say, like, the movie industry or the film industry, like, if you look at Netflix, for example, they have a, I think they have a 23-page document on subtitles and how to how to make them properly. And uh, they have a standard. So um, they made that standard, and they, and they apply that standard to every show on Netflix and every movie on Netflix, okay? There's no standard in the game industry. I think that's a big harm to them because some subtitles are, like, very small, um, I was playing Xenoblade Chronicles X on the Wii U. Everything in that game is small. Every piece of dialogue in that text is horribly small. And so if I'm either not on a monitor that's super close or a big TV, I literally can't see anything. So it's horrible. And um, there's no option to change it. So just those things. And I think on the topic of making a standard, I think that's something that would really benefit if there was just an organization for accessibility standards that companies listen to. Um, my dream would be that when you get a game off of a shelf and you see the ESRB logo, there would be another logo right next to it showing what kind of accessibility options were in the game and then Ooh. rating how accessible the game was. I like that, Tristan. I, I, hope, I hope the right people see this episode. And this is why I was very excited to do this. I know, I mean, you can probably tell from my questions, I, I don't know very much about this, um, but I think you're right. A lot of us saw on Twitter this; these games have some cool stuff, and we played with it just to play with it without really being able to fully understand why this is so significant in the community. So I hope that this sparks uh, some some conversation that we can bring up. I really, really like that idea. Now I'm curious who I can bring that idea up to and i know the america is it the americans with disabilities act the ada i think yeah they do have i know that like websites if if we're building websites for for clients there are certain things that you can do to be ada compliant uh, that has to do with menu options and text colors and pdfs things like that so the ada doesn't have any regulation in the video game industry, like they don't have any. I don't think that's yeah. I don't think there's really any regulation outside of like. Actually, no. I don't even think there's any regulation 
outside of they put uh, they put what is it epilepsy warnings and like photosensitive warnings on their games like on games in general They're, those are just warnings that exist on the box or sometimes even before the game loads up and that's about it when it comes to accessibility that's legally mandated as far as I'm sh- as far as I'm as far as I know so it's just a warning wow absolutely um, I mean it, it, they they may I mean even if I mean, they may have something we don't know about, yeah. but I'm, yeah. I'm guessing. I honestly admit I don't know, but I don't think there is any. Yeah, if if it is, I'm guessing maybe subtitles because I think that's the only consistent thing I've seen in the last ten plus years. But even with subtitles, let's just assume subtitles are consistent, and I don't think they are. But even with them, they're not all made the same way, right? So that's that's a problem, and so I don't know. If you're gonna put subtitles in a game like the Halo example, why isn't that in all of the game? Why are there moments when there just aren't subtitles there? That really frustrates me. No, I, I can understand that. I I'm still just stuck on the comment you made where you would like to see a rating on each game, right? On on the copy, on the physical copy that tells how accessible the game is. I think that's freaking awesome. Actually, and I'm I'm curious to see what effect it will have on the gaming industry. Uh, this is, I mean, we don't script stuff out or plan stuff out very well. But I, I did look a little bit up a, a few minutes ago before we before we we met to do this, and I, I found a few places on the internet that said roughly twenty percent of of casual gamers, so of people who are consumers of games. They're they're actively buying games, installing them and playing them on a system their household owns. 20% of them have some type of impairment or a legal disability. Interesting. So, I didn't think it was that high if I'm being honest. And I mean some of these are they said some of them are are very minor. I mean some of them may include an individual who's an adult just reading, you know, on on a lower level or some of it may be just a slight vision impairment. But still a fifth of people who are actively buying games to have need for accessibility is really big. How big could the gaming industry be if we accommodated a lot more of those folks who have those issues who aren't already in the gaming industry? I didn't know the numbers, so that was really cool hearing. So the way I see that, because I've actually thought about that too, I've thought about it like a bubble. And so at the end of the bubble is how far we can push a game to make it as able for like as many people as possible. I think, unfortunately, and I hate saying this, there's just going to be some people who can't play ga- certain games. Like that's just the nature of disabilities, unfortunately. And I hate bringing it up, but we have to. But here's the thing: I don't think we're anywhere close to that border of the bubble yet. And so, if we can get games to that point, we could have a lot more people in that bubble enjoying games. And I think we're not at that point yet. Um, where the bubble is filled of everyone who could who could be in there. I definitely have to agree, especially looking at at the numbers. So we're we're we have not been the industry hasn't been able to accommodate yeah. a very large group of people, but to know that the people we we have been accommodating makes up uh, a fifth of us is pretty significant. So I, I I see that as a win for the gaming industry. Obviously it's more sales for the developers so certainly any costs that go into these accessibility options are made back but as gamers we have more people to share that passion with more people to play with more people to discuss that with um not to change topics but i kind of want to talk about because i gave a few examples most examples are good uh, accessibility i think there's some that are rather bad um, let's talk about it man let's this is all about let's I'm, let's let's talk about it um I think I think a lot of um, Japanese developers like Nintendo and Square Enix are really lacking in accessibility options. And I think this comes from a mindset that I, honestly I kind of agree with to an extent that like the game I make is is art. It, it's the way I want it to be. I'm not going to change it. That's how I want it to be. I'm going to ship it out like it is. And and I think to a degree I get that games are art. I want to I want to agree with that stance. Um, the problem becomes when when there's not even an option in, in a lot of like Nintendo games to just change what button does what. Why can't I even do that? Like there's 
there's so many easy fixes to a lot of this, a lot of these things. Like this, the Switch, for example, it has like the option system wide. But if I want to play Breath of the Wild and press the X button to jump for some, oh wait, no, that already does jump. But press the B button to jump, right? For some reason, I have to switch that on a system wide level. That's really frustrating. Um, just things like that. It's super, super simple things that we could fix that just aren't. And see, I never thought of button mapping as something that could assist with accessibility. I, again, kind of, because I'm not affected uh, by these, by that, I just kind of said, well, if a developer says that this is the best way to experience it, because I generally tend to leave everything on default, at least in the first go around, because right. I make the assumption that, well, the developers think that the best experience is this to jump, this to this. But I didn't really think about an individual that may have something on a motor skill level that uh, it might be very, very significant to that individual to simply change a few buttons or change some simple options. So I see what other examples of, uh, can you can you give um, us like that? I can think of, oh my gosh, someone moving something outside. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, I can think of, I believe it was Doom that had this, the, the modern Doom uh Doom 2016. I don't know if Eternal had this, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to assume, but there was a colorblind mode. That you know what a colorblind mode sounds great on paper, but essentially what it did was that, like it was one. It was one of those spectrums I talked about, and it matched all the colors on the game to that spectrum, but that doesn't help people at all because what it what what it does is you're just like changing the colors on them, and it and it just you're essentially if I'm understanding it correctly when I was researching it is that the person's just going to see things the way they already saw it because you're just matching it to them more or actually it could make it worse because some colors that they thought would be one way are now brown for some reason and then uh basically though if you try to match all your colors to one colorblind spectrum you're missing on the fact that everyone in their day-to-day -day lives sees colors the way they see the colors like it's not going to help you don't want to do it like that. So colorblindness settings work well when you can change specific aspects of a game, but not like the whole game, if that makes sense. Okay, that does, yeah. I, it's really hard to explain because I'm not colorblind myself, so I can't be in their shoes. But from my understanding, it just messes with things a lot. Okay, so there are a lot of... I see why that's hard to articulate because... It's it's not just a standard colorblind means this. It's colorblind could be this or this or this or yeah. this. So we really have to accommodate all of these little sections in order to, to properly give everyone who's on one of those spectrums the yeah. correct experience. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Any any other examples that you can think not of? Can, not that I could think of. Um mm. I think, yeah, I think there's, I think there's some, I think we've kind of grown out of it at this point, but I think having motion controls being forced on the player isn't just annoying to people, but it's also, uh, it makes it difficult for people who have accessibility options. Like, like the general population just hates forced motion controls, but if you have accessibility needs and you can't move your wrists around that much or whatever have you, forced motion, motion controls are literally going to stop you from playing the game. Um, it's why I've appreciated that we've kind of moved on from it, but I can't think of a particular game now, but I'm sure... Oh, wait, yeah, actually, I can. Uh, Super Mario Odyssey, Nintendo again, they literally have some options that, or some moves that Mario can do with his hat. Like, if you want to move it, he can throw his hat upwards, but only if you shake the Joy-Cons up. There's no option to do that. Up or down is only shaking up or down. It's something su super simple that they could have mapped to a button, but they chose not to. Ah, uh, and see, I, it's all of the stuff that I don't think about because I'm so blessed with shake it. Okay, no problem. Shake it. So that's, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're bringing all this up because, you know, these are, these are things that we need to know and maybe, um, you know, get, get talking about on Twitter. Twitter is certainly a, a great place or, um, even to some people, if, if somebody walks away from this, um, that's really passionate. You know, maybe they can reach out uh, to their favorite developer, or just try to try to learn more about it. Try to try to research and, and try to understand it a little bit better. Um, is there any 
uh, as we kind of close out here, is there anything, any kind of final words, um, any important information, any advice, any, anything that you, um, feel really passionate to share about, about this? Um, well, for final words, I just want to bring up something that I thought was really cool. Um, I can't think of the name of it right now. You're going to have to look this up, but there's, there's a game, like it's an RPG that was designed for, um, for deaf people, or not deaf people, sorry, for blind people. And so the game has like no visuals at all. It's all audio. And so, uh, it's perfect for people who can't see because there's nothing to see to begin with. And so they designed it around that. And I think that that's really cool. Um, I just wanted to bring that up because I thought that was really, really interesting. That um, is super cool. I'm going to Google that really quickly because I want, I want us to talk about that for a minute. Um, R P G for. I want to look it up too, see if I can find it. Yeah. I wish I wish I knew what the name of us was off the top of my hand. Is it Heroes Call? Maybe. Heroes Call is a fantasy RPG developed by two blind people who had a love for gaming before losing their sight. Oh, they okay. Check this out. They created out of sight games. So they have a development company, Out of Sight, and they're creating games exclusively for you, it could be played by both uh, blind and sighted people, but that is really freaking cool. Yeah. I don't know if uh, that's what I was thinking of, but that is really cool. That is actually really cool. Um, so what um, kind of, so if, if somebody were to play that in a, in, in the mode, right. To be played by blind people or people that have a significant visual impairment, Everything is, is only audio. Every single cue. Is yeah, the thing, I don't know if that was what I was thinking of, but if it is, then yeah, it's, uh, yeah, every, everything's audio. So it'll be like, um, I, I didn't see enough gameplay of it to describe it to you, but let's assume like there's a wall in front of you. It'll tell you like how many spaces in front of you it is or units of measurement, whatever they use, right? Or it'll tell you if you're fighting something, how much damage it did to you. And it'll just say it audibly. Like, uh, like I'm talking to you right now. It'll just be like, the dragon did 15 damage to you and, and whatever. And so, um, like, that might be hard for us to keep track of, being as we can see. But if you if you live your life completely blind, then you can probably remember that stuff a lot easier. And I'm sure there's options to recall that information back to you. So, uh, That is so things. cool. That yeah. is super cool. I'm I'm so glad I'm so glad that you came on and and talked about this. I hope um I hope folks really like this episode and I hope they learn a lot about it. I certainly learned a lot about accessibility and I'm um I feel extremely grateful almost in a very emotional way as we're kind of wrapping this up. I I feel just so I I really am getting uh, emotional from the discussion. Uh, it's simple things that I took for granted being somebody who's enjoyed gaming for close to 40 years. And to think of how many individuals out there uh, don't have the chance to experience it like I do, uh, and being able to maybe be a voice to help those individuals get the experience out of it. Like I get is really, it's really incredible. It's really empowering. Yeah. I, I think, uh, this conversation will be really empowering to a lot of people. If I had the chance to sit down with the developer and tell them anything, I would tell them, uh, try to accommodate as many people as possible. I think if you can do that, then your game becomes a lot more successful and well-loved. Yeah, and I love the idea. I really, really, really hope folks are going to hear your idea of adding uh, an accessibility um, rating on the games. Yes. I think that's brilliant, Tristan. Absolutely brilliant. That's, I would love that. I just don't know how that's going to happen. Like, I, I definitely, I thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, saying, saying it's brilliant. I really want that. I, I definitely do. Cause right now, if you're the average consumer who has a disability, you walk into a store and you just want to pick up any game. You can't do that without possibly wasting your money. Um, that's just one of those things where you have to you would have to look it up and then research and all those extra steps that I don't have to do that you don't have to do, but these people do right now. If there was just literally just that logo that would describe those things to you, 
make things so much easier. Yeah. See, and another thing that I wouldn't have thought about, it's something that I overlooked. Uh, it, it's because it's something that I don't have to do. So yeah. fantastic. Tristan, thank you so much for coming on. This was, was great. I hope the folks that are watching and listening learn as much as I did today from you. Yeah. Thank you for letting me be here. This was awesome. All right. I'm glad you had fun. Well, maybe you can uh, come on some other time and we'll, um, we'll try to find some developers in the, in the gaming industry and we'll try to open up some more discussions to talk about uh, features like this and, and talk about the costs. And um, maybe we can, maybe we can suggest getting your rating on there. If I can, if I can get in their ear. That would be really fun, for sure. All right. Everybody, thanks so much for watching episode three. And again, Tristan, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. All right. Bye, everybody.